Well, it's my privilege uh, this morning to introduce Barbara Ryan. Um, she's the executive director of the World Geospatial Industry Council. It's a private sector group um, that um, uh, gets together to confer in this area and figure out ways to collaborate and to work with the public sector. Um, Barbara Ryan has a distinguished career. She had an entire career with USGS, was playing several roles there, and then I guess retired once, went to the Geneva with the w World Meteorological Organization, uh, retired again, a <laughs> group on Earth observations picked her up. Um, I think she's got invaluable skills, obviously, and um, so uh, <clears throat> now serving as uh, executive director of this World Geospatial Industry. So interesting how she's bridging uh, the public and the private, and we look forward to hearing from you on that, Barb. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks for the uh, kind introduction. It's um, really a pleasure to be here. I uh, just would like to reinforce Shawan's comments about yesterday, and actually the day before as well. It was really... Uh, quite exciting to just see the depth of conversations that are taking place. So nice work to everyone. Um, I've got, um, uh, we'll make sure we get you out of here on time so the conference uh, stays on time. But um, I've got one slide that just goes into uh, a little bit more detail, kind of following up uh, on those comments. So I've kind of titled it 71 years and 71 seconds. We'll try and do it in 71 seconds. Um, but I think from a geography standpoint, I really do want to say um, I think there's a, there's a power uh, with place. And uh, I was born in Dalton, New York, a small farming community in western New York. So I know we got somebody from Binghamton here, not too far away. It was south of Rochester and south of Buffalo. <clears throat> but for those New Yorkers, you will know we call this the Grand Canyon of the East, which is quite interesting because then, of course, I went on to spend 34 years uh, with the U.S. Geological Survey and, of course, John Wesley Powell, uh, who did a lot of exploration on the big Grand Canyon uh, of the West, I guess. But he was actually born in Mount Morris, New York. So while I grew up on the southern reaches of Letcher State Park, it's the Genesee River, and if you know about New York, those rivers flow north into Lake Ontario. Uh, and so uh, he grew up at the southern, at the northern end, the southern end, the northern end of that river. And um, and so for me, I think after spending 34 years with the Geological Survey, I often go back and think about where I was born. And I guess I would challenge each of you to think about that too. Is there, in fact, uh, almost a visceral feeling that you have in your body about where you were born. And are there kind of almost some roots that go back? And I, for me, that's the power of place and it's the role of geography. You'll see education there, you'll see uh, employment there. If we have time, I'll come back to the USGS because I do have uh, a funny story about Champaign, Illinois. Uh, I did serve on the board with uh, Jane Goodall <clears throat> from 2018 to 2021, a remarkable woman. Um, 86, 87 years old, still traveling about 322 days a year during COVID. She didn't, of course. She was back at her hometown in the UK, and she commented at that time she hadn't spent more than two consecutive weeks at her hometown for the last 40 years. And of course, during COVID, she did. And then all of you know this about um, just the support that you get from your family on careers uh, as you go through time. And uh, there's a picture of uh, our family. So um, let's set the context for geospatial in everything and geospatial for everyone. We're going through a major rebranding effort right now for WGIC because if you look at our last brand, okay, there was a compass in the end. In fact, my, oh, I don't have my pin on. The pin still showed that. Um, but it didn't actually say anything. And so uh, we worked with, uh, I think, a really talented person uh, out of India who just interviewed us and had us talk about geospatial. And uh, he actually came up with geospatial and everything, geospatial for everyone. And after he heard the scope of our programs, this illustration shows that whether it's the atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, or really importantly, the built environment and the human sphere. He goes, those are what you touch. 
And so then you'll see this new logo, which is, of course, kind of focusing on the fact that we're world, but bolding geospatial. And then he pulled all the colors in from the atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, and the built environment, even with, I don't know if I can, anyway, you'll see that gray cube that after talking to us actually added a third dimension to illustrate that built environment. And so the power of logos and branding are quite significant, but he advocated, you need to have a story. And so for us, this logo kind of helps tell the story about geospatial for, uh, in everything and for everyone. So just real quickly on WGIC, three very simple uh, objectives. We are a trade association, so we are not for profit, but, um, uh, but as Tom said, you only, uh, you have to be a private sector company to join. We want to make sure we strengthen the contributions of the industry to the global, to society and the global economy. We advance global policy matters, and we, of course, want to create business opportunities for the geospatial industry. Those are our objectives. If we just, and, and we talked a lot yesterday when you, any slide that had those sustainable development goals or any references to the other UN conventions, it's really important to bring data from data, products, services, and tools that the commercial sector has into those domains. And I'll show a case study of that a little bit later on. Um, but if we just look at that second objective about advancing global uh, uh, policy issues, we do issue a series of re reports, and every single one of these is going to be released next week uh, at Intergeo, or as the Europeans say, Intergeo, uh, leadership uh, diversity in our industry, uh, bringing geospatial context to the metaverse, and some work we've done in Africa about Africa geospatial public-private partnerships. So. Uh, you can uh, get access to those off our website. And I got an email yesterday saying the new website is live with all the new branding. So feel free to go on there. If it crashes, please let me know so we get it solved before next week in, uh, in Berlin. Some reports that we did before are uh, AI, geospatial AI ML uh, and also spatial digital twins. I'll come back. I'm going to spend more time talking about that greenhouse gas monitoring. Um, but these two reports on the end, and again, those are the QR codes. When I tried it last night, um, you got to do two clicks to actually get to that report. But we did global scans of legislation around the world that either dealt with artif uh, geospatial artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning and also spatial digital twins. So a global scan because we're a global organization. And then what we'll do, we aren't shy about making recommendations either to the industry or back to governments in any of those domains. We did one on the protection of personal privacy information. Clearly those in Europe know about GDPR. That was either the most comprehensive or the most uh, prescriptive, however you look at it. And uh, aside from the California protection policy here in the United States, uh, there was no other legislation around the world that came close to what Europe is doing on the protection of personal privacy information. Um, just real quickly, our members, uh, patron members, those are the big geospatial Earth observation companies around the world, making over 100 million, oftentimes over a billion dollars a year. Oracle, so you heard from Shiva yesterday. I realized when, uh, Shawan, when you were presenting your partner slide on the first day that both Max are and Planet also contribute to iGUIDE. And so I went back and circled them. Uh, corporate members, and then you'll see co those corporate members are between $10 million and $100 million. And then these are the companies that are making under $10 million a year, a, and some a lot under $1 million, a lot of startups. And you'll see a lot of the new space actors, uh, um, Earth um, observation companies. So that's WGIC. Uh, if you are a private sector company or work with somebody, please point them in our direction. We'd love to have them join uh, the organization. Um, so let's see. Let's kind of 
talk um, about what I think are some essential yet often missing elements in this whole ecosystem. I'm gonna spend a little time on open data and then just real briefly touch on technological advances. I feel very strongly about better integration and coordination and then clearly hyper-partnering. Um, all of those things are required. They take a lot of work and, um, and I think as, a, as an ecosystem, uh, we could be doing better actually on every single one of those uh, domains. Uh, again, we heard yesterday about how essential this is for uh, linking to policy mandates. So whether it's the Climate Accord, whether it's the uh, uh, Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, or whether it's the Sustainable Development Goals. Geospatial information and technologies, and let's, we'll broaden it, I think Earth observations is a very big category because for me it's any observations in, on, or around the Earth. But I know um, the word geospatial is really important and people are wedded to it, but we must think very broadly about what geospatial information is and it underpins all of those. So if we look at open data, this comes from um, uh, experience when I worked with the Geological Survey. Um, this graph starts in 2009 uh, out to 2020. Now the first Landsat satellite was actually launched in 1972. So 1972 on that graph would be over here somewhere. Um, look at the uh, downloads in uh, 20, 2009. I mean just barely on the graph. So we now have had 50 years of this Landsat program. NASA builds and launches the satellites. The US Geological Survey operates the satellites once they're successfully on orbit and always controlled the data release. Um, there were people back in 1972 that said the data should be broadly and openly available. And yet USGS wasn't resourced like NASA was resourced, and so at that time they argued, well, we need more money to get the data out the door. So we sold uh, Landsat data, four or $500 a scene, um, up until the 80s when the private sector took over the satellite, uh, it went up to four or $5,000 a scene. Of course, everything tanked at that point because nobody was gonna pay four or $5,000 a scene. Government takes it over again, goes back to four or $500 a scene. And so when I came into the division in uh, 2000, um, of course we saw that we're distributing 53 scenes a day. So for many years, 30 or 40, I think we were asking the wrong question. How could you have justified uh, the billions of dollars that went into this satellite over 40 years by only distributing 53 scenes a day. There's something crazy about that question, but we get lulled into uh, thinking that. In fact, some folks out of the University of Maryland, Sam Goward uh, and uh, I was gonna say Daryl Hurd, Daryl Williams, who was at NASA at the time, think that up until 2008 when the policy changed, we were maybe using 3% of the archive. This is, a, and, and I think that's happening across the board with a lot of geospatial data and information that's collected. So we finally went and said, okay, who's buying those 53 scenes a day? Number one, other federal agencies. Number two, universities, largely paid for by NSF and federal money. Number three, contractors, again, largely on behalf of the federal government. So we said, we are incurring transaction costs, administration, by just moving money from four, four, four and a half or five million dollars. So let me just be honest, for the US Geological Survey, that's not chump change, that was substantial money. It wasn't a good investment for the government. We were incurring costs by moving that money from this pocket to this pocket. So finally, we went to the White House and the Office of Management and Budget and the House of Representatives and the Senate, and you can imagine, this was a long fight, certainly, we started fighting when I got into the job in 2000, um, but I will be honest, there were people that fought this back to the beginning of the first Landsat satellite. So finally convinced uh, the government, just give it away, just give it away. And I, and I guess maybe the funny story about that as well is there's a, there's a policy in the United States called COFR, the cost of fulfilling user requests. So any federal government 
can't charge you for the data that it, or the money that it costs to collect that, build the stream gauge, collect that data. They can only charge you for the amount of money that it costs to get the data out the door. Now maybe there was a justification at four or $500 a scene when we were putting Landsat scenes on disks and then shipping them out the door. But as soon as this data went out to be distributed over the internet, there is no incremental cost. Once you get that first scene out, there's no incremental cost for that second scene or any subsequent scene. So we actually used COFER to say, we're not even complying with these regulations because it's not costing us anything, but we're still sharing uh, this data. Anyway, finally sign off on it in two, at the end of 2007. And uh, after the policy change, uh, two orders of magnitude, 5,700 scenes per day. I think uh, these are maybe 2017 numbers. It's even higher. But more importantly is this next slide. Some economic, I had left the survey in 2008, but an economic analysis was done first in 2011, and then again, this open file report was done in 2019, um, and shows only these economic benefits that have increased. In the US, in 2011, $1.8 billion, $2.1 billion of economic benefit back to the US far exceeding the four and a half or $5 million that we were collecting to sell that Landsat data. And internationally, $400 million to $1.3 billion. So these are the economic benefits of, in this case, this geospatial data. Now this is one satellite. You know, can you think if governments around the world, governments around the world, money paid by taxpayers to build the satellites, launch the satellites, or the stream gauging network, or the weather stations, or the geological monitoring stations. All of this data that's paid for at taxpayer expense needs to be broadly and openly available. We argued that when I went into the group on Earth observations. Uh, I think Europe's Sentinel policy and their entire Copernicus program was influenced by this Landsat decision. They never thought the USGS or the United States was gonna start letting this data up. That put tremendous pressure. Are there countries around the world that still need to move in this direction? Absolutely. But for me, they're this, the economic benefits of broad open policy for data that's collected by uh, taxpayer money need to be out and, 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 and these benefits would only expand as those different data sources uh, expand. So um, that's the open data story, at least with, from a Landsat perspective. Uh, let's transition into this uh, public-private collaboration case study. Um, this is uh, greenhouse gas monitoring from space, or, uh, some work we did uh, back before the Glasgow Conference of the Parties. Uh, so that was in uh, 20, uh, 2021, I guess. Um, uh, we worked with uh, Al Gore's uh, organization now, former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. He's got an organization called Climate Trace in California. They do a lot of work on methane observations around the world. We worked with my former organization, the Group on Earth Observations, and then, of course, WGIC. I knew about a database from my USGS days that um, the government space agencies have a coordination group called the CS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. So that is where NASA and NOAA and USGS and JAXA and the European Space Agency and India and China all come together. Korea, we were talking about that walking over here today, all come together. They have a missions, instruments, and measurements database, a MIM database. Talks about all the, can, all the variables that can be measured from space by these public sector satellites. I come into WGIC and I go, well, where's an analog on the private sector side? Turns out there isn't one. So we said, well, listen, let's just take a baby step and look at those constituents, those greenhouse gas constituents that are recognized by the convention. So that's um, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Just three constituents will pull out 
of CS, the, the public data set, what the public agencies are doing, will go out to all the space agencies and all the space organizations, companies on the private sector side and say, what are you doing in this area? So um, don't worry about the details. You can get this out of the report, but 33 total missions were identified, 21 on the public sector side, 13 were in orbit, seven in development. On the private sector side, there were seven. Uh, there was only one in orbit and operational. One was in its final trial period, but it's still not delivering data and fiber and development. And then what we saw and didn't expect was the emergence of hybrid missions. That's not just the government giving the private sector money to build and launch these satellites. That's the, the uh, private sector and or philanthropic organizations coming in with their own money and the private public sector coming in and we called them hybrid missions because it's a mixed funding stream and they were there are five of those all in development. <clears throat> so um, all those missions are described in the database, their data policies are, and there's a difference in data sharing for sure on the private sector side. I don't want to underestimate that at all. Um, but let's look at uh, let's look at some of the data. So the color scheme here is the public missions are shown in blue, the private missions in red, and those hybrid missions that I talked about in gray. So um, you'll see what's in orbit, uh, what's in development, and what's the end of the mission. So in orbit, mostly public sector. I told you there was one private sector uh, company with on-orbit capability. But look at that in development. It's a third, a third, a third. Third government, third public, third hybrid, which is an emergence in this whole field. And then there was one public sector that was end of mission. If you look at that same data from the, um, a decadal perspective, all public up until 2011, to 2020 when, again, you see the emergence of that one private sector mission. And as we look from this decade out, again, you're gonna see a third, a third, a third. Uh, if we just take that graph and look at it a different way, 100% of the missions were public uh, up until 2011. And then again, 2021 to 2030, that's where you see a third, a third, a third. We could look at that same data by um, gas type. So again, public, private, hybrid, blue, red, and green. These are the missions by gas type, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. And then we said, well, listen, kind of let's look at the scale uh, of data for which they collect. And so what you see here moving from point source to global is what we expected. The private sector or those hybrid missions are coming in with increased spatial, spectral, or temporal resolution. So they're looking at smaller pieces on the Earth's surface. Those public sector missions, while some of them have the capability to detect those really big emitters, many of them are collecting really broad scale data that are done by the public sector. So our message back to the Conference of the Parties is, you need both. You need that global scan on CO2 or methane, and you need to know where those individual emitters are if you want to tackle those. Uh, the last couple slides we have is um, missions by country. So again, color scheme stays the same, public-private hybrid. Uh, on this graph, uh, you'll see the US is uh, quite high. That's the spike down at the end and has representation across all three uh, sectors. And then also, uh, these were um, just what's in, color scheme changed a little bit, but it's in orbit and in development. And again, you can see the US has got uh, a lot in development. So uh, the message is, again, this might be kind of hard to see. You'll have these slides later. Um, satellite observations absolutely will help reduce the uncertainty in this mission monitoring. Uh, you need to continue to invest in your public space agencies. They were here 50 years ago. We hope they're here 50 years from now. They are the workhorses, particularly when I think about Landsat, is the workhorse of Earth observations, and you need that for continuity. Um, but if you aren't taking advantage of these private sector capabilities, then you governments are sub-optimizing, I would say, your response to the, the sustainable development goals that we heard about yesterday, you're sub-optimizing your response for climate action, um, and then we just went on to talk about hybrid models and the importance of open data. So 
we call for continued cooperation between and among public and private sector entities to fully maximize this complementarity, synergies and capacities to support policymakers in their race to uh, net zero going forward. So that's um, the link with one, I think, really good case study. But again, remember, a baby step, just those three constituents. Can you imagine if we had a similar analysis for all the constituents that can be measured from space and are being measured on the ground as well? Um, and then I think I have just a couple more slides, and that's, let's just maybe transition real quick to that technological advances part um, of the slide. This report that's gonna be issued uh, next week is bringing geospatial context to the metaverse, considerations for next steps. And <clears throat> the um, position that we're putting forward in this paper and building on the work we did with our spatial digital twins report is, um, let me back up. Spatial digital, tw digital twins have been long used in the manufacturing environment for this automobile, for this motorcycle. So what we've seen, I think, of late is, I kind of say it's finally moving from the factory to the streets. We're bringing spatial digital twins out, I mean, into our lives. So whether it's a spatial digital twin of this room, this building, uh, New York City, New York State, the country, or like Europe wants to do with the Earth, we ought to be doing a better job of linking and integrating these spatial digital twins. And so whether the private sector does it or whether the commercial sector or the government are producing these spatial digital twins, we ought to have better interoperability. Yep, looking at OGC in the room and they have a metaverse working group and that's really important. Um, but it's also not just about standards. For as essential as they are, this is a leadership issue for people stepping up and integrating this data. And we heard about that in spades yesterday, and this is where I think iGUIDE can really be a useful forcing function. So if you think about spatial digital twins linked everywhere, um, does that not create a virtual representation of the universe that we live in, and that's the metaverse? So what we're saying is while people want to define the metaverse as just a gaming environment, it is, and millions of hours are spent gaming. People game in real life. The metaverse is not just about 3D visualization. The metaverse can be used as a forcing function to finally get in, truly integrated across all the domains. And I think spatial digital twins are the way to go by linking that uh, representation. Um, are there challenges? Of course, you know, if we look at the hype curve, digital twins, some would argue they haven't even hit the trough yet. Uh, the report that's gonna come out next week will show the metaverse is farther up that curve, not down the curve. So there's a lot of hype. I know companies are trying to brand it, but I would implore, actually, the geospatial community to not be defined by how individual entities wanna describe the metaverse or define the metaverse, but for us to think about the Latin source of that word, meta-universe. It's something about the universe that we live in, and that's, I think, how we should be thinking about the metaverse. So, in closing, open data, technological advances, absolutely need better integration and uh, coordination and uh, hyper-partnering linkages to those policy mandates. Um, and I think I'm, um, I'll stop there and hopefully have some time for questions. Thanks.